so much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to remind everyone that if you could mute your microphone, this will help keep background noise to a minimum and make sure you mute it if you're not speaking. Also, if you have any questions, you can submit those in the chat window and presenters will have time for questions and answers toward the end of the presentation. And um, so what I would like to first of all do is I'd like to introduce you to our two presenters today. Um, our presenters are Cheryl Fitz and Tina Ross. Cheryl Fitz has over 25 years of experience as an educator and currently serves as the SCDE Office of Educator Office of Special Education Services Family and Community Engagement Liaison. During her time there, Cheryl also sat as ombudsman helping to resolve information disputes between schools and families of children served under IDEA while reestablishing productive school family working relationships. She's taught students within various disability categories and program levels, helping develop and implement select district special education initiatives and has served as special education needs consultant at the district and state agency levels. Cheryl's aim is to generate effective communication among students, educators, and families, enabling them to work together towards student success. And as I said, we also have Tina Ross with us here today. She came to South Carolina from Iowa, where she held a variety of roles during her nearly 30 years of public education. She's been a classroom teacher in middle and high school, a curriculum director, special education director, PK principal, interim high school principal, and worked on the RTI MTSS team at the State Department and even served as interim superintendent. The one thing that she has learned is that relationships are key and those relationships involve kids, families, and colleagues and make tough conversations easier. We'd like to welcome them and uh, we wish them luck as they present today. Thank you so much and hello everyone and welcome to the planning the pathway to family re-engagement session. Uh, before we begin our conversation uh, there is a question. You see the question posed here. What does good family involvement or engagement look like to you? This is something for you to think about and to help you to help us set the framework for our discussion today. So when thinking about your setting, your school, your community, your district, from your perspective, what would you see? What would you hear if there's good family engagement or involvement going on? If you take a minute and just put that in the chat for us. We have one that says meaningful collaboration. Mm -hmm. And collaboration you know, is very important. Oh, that's a good one, Elizabeth. Equal partnerships. Mm. That was a good one. I was going to say, I know we're asking you to think right after lunch, which is not always the <laughs> easiest thing to do. So. We'd appreciate it if you would just kind of bear with us a little bit here. Indeed, and thank you. And thank you for uh, participating in that because having schools in which educators and families work as partners to support student learning is what we hope for when looking to develop those solid family engagements within our schools. And this takes on various forms. And today we hope to help direct you on a path that works for you your school, your community, and your families. So we've done introductions and thank you so much, John, for the, the very nice uh, formal introduction that you gave us. And I am Cheryl Fitz. Uh, I work in OSIS as the Family and Community Engagement Liaison. And I'm also part of the Social Emotional Learning Focus Group. And joining me today is Tina. And I am also part of the social emotional learning group, but I am also part of the post-secondary outcomes group. So I have my feet in two, two pods over there. So if you would also, our participants, if you would also put in the chat your position, where are you from, are you administrator, parent liaison, a parent, uh, advocate, uh, state agency, let us know where you're from. So that would help us in stirring specific information that may be helpful to you. 
And while you are doing that, I just want to share some uh, brief norms. Uh, first of all, we ask that you give grace. That was something that was Pulowski and uh, Regina Thurman were talk talking about this morning. But grace is essential and we are in a virtual environment and technology glitches do happen. So while in this virtual setting, miscommunications can occur, particularly when we're missing those body language cues that, that help bring understanding. Uh, so we're asking for grace and muted microphones, of course, helps to cut down on distractions, improve audio quality. But the last set of norms, I think, apply not only within a virtual setting such as this one, but it transcends to all forms of communication, particularly those interactions between families and educators. Remember to allow for equity of voice, to pause, put ideas on the table, listen actively, be present in the conversation and respect all perspectives. And this can be done by presuming positive intentions and probing for clarity. Tina, who do we have joining us today? We have a, a wide variety. We have parent advocates. We have family liaisons at a school district. We have a number of administrators. We have uh, teachers. We have um, federal court or yeah, federal coordinators at the district. We're all over the board today, which is this, awesome to this see. This is good. This is good. This it is, is good. awesome to see. <laughs> It is. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. We really hope that you're able to get some information out of here that you can utilize uh, in your positions, uh, be it state, district, school level. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. So this is just a brief overview of what we're going to share in the next 40 minutes or so. Uh, in today's session, we will give a brief definitions of family involvement at the federal, state, and local levels. This will serve sort of as a foundational set of information for us. Uh, we would then look more closely at the steps we can take to reach family re-engagement through the plan, do, adjust, and reflect methods, and end with some information and resources to help you in reaching families. So every student succeeds act. This has been around since 2015, but we're going to start the conversation by defining parent involvement at this level. According to ESSA, all LEAs must reach out to all parents and family members and implement programs based upon meaningful consultation held with those parents. So this is overseen by Title I office, which requires LEAs and schools to jointly develop and annually evaluate a written parent and family engagement policy. It involves families in the decisions regarding how reserved Title I funds are going to be allotted for family engagement activities. Uh, to convene an annual meeting to explain the requirements of Title I Part A and the right of the parents to be involved, and then to develop a school parent compact in partnership with parents for all children served on, under Title I. And that outlines how families, the entire school staff, and students will share the responsibility for improved student academic achievement and the means by which the school and families will build and develop a partnership to help children achieve the state standards. Uh, there's a resource that we have available for you, which is uh, SCDE Title I Office has provided a question and answer document that addresses the ESSA requirements during uh, COVID-19. So it answers questions on the type of documentation needed when conducting virtual meetings and acceptable uses for spending money for virtual activities and, and other pertinent information. And that is in your chat right now. Thank you, Tina. Now, we heard about the South Carolina Family Engagement uh, K through 12 framework this morning from Regina and Les Regina Thurman and Leslie Bloss. Uh, and we have a good overview of the framework and in our session. Uh, we just wanted to touch on it briefly because it is a state mandate. And it does charge the state superintendent of education with promoting family engagement in South Carolina schools. And as you know, uh, we currently have a family and community, community engagement liaison, which is Ms. Thurman, and various departments throughout the agency 
work specifically toward promoting family involvement, including our office, the Office of Special Education Services. Uh, the framework provides a structure for educators to promote family-friendly schools where all stakeholders are equipped and the necessary tools to support student success is made available. So it provides additional guidance to districts on developing family engagement action plans, and it identifies resources to implement those strategies. Also recognizing that family involvement is been built upon mutual respect, the four areas within this framework are noted here on this slide. And many of you shared this morning how you were promoting successful engagement practices and utilizing one or more of these focus areas. But more information on this framework can be obtained on the SCDE website and a link to the SCDE family engagement K through 12 framework is also listed among our references. This I think uh, was, was very eye opening and it should not have been as long as I've been in the State Department. But the purpose of the framework, as you know, is to influence thinking and suggest action steps necessary to implement family engagement policies and practices uh, at the state district and school level. And the same legislative mandate that addresses the state superintendent uh, also addresses district superintendents, charging them to ensure parental involvement efforts. And part of that charge involves the consideration of designating staff to serve as parent liaisons. I'm so glad to have some parent liaisons here with us. And it requires each school to designate a faculty contact person for parental involvement and designated spaces within the school specifically for parents with materials and resources on parent school partnerships. And one of the reasons I said this took me aback a little bit because of all my years in the public school setting, nobody told me <laughs> nobody told me about this special place just for uh parents how many of you know or knew about or familiar with the designated space and if you are familiar with it do you know where it's located in your schools if you are put that in the chat and tell us where that designated space is within your school or you can also tell us how it's used in your school district or at the school level First, Brave Soul, Brave Soul spoke up and said, this is the first time hearing this. You're not alone. <laughs> I'm not alone. <laughs> okay, I was like, sure, should I really admit the fact <laughs> you didn't yeah. know? You're not alone. Ah, all those years in school. Yeah. No one, no oh, one good. Mentioned it. Good. Someone else said that they have eight Title I schools and each one has a parent resource center. Good. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, each school district superintendent um, will work to support family engagement within their schools. One was not aware that it was required, but it is available and it happens to be in her office by the looks of things. <laughs> oh, really? Do you find it beneficial? Do parents take advantage of it? Mm -hmm. I agreed with that one. COVID has limited the usefulness of the Parent Resource Center. Mm -hmm. I can see that. Yes, we'd have to actually make it a virtual space at this point, wouldn't we? Um, and that that brings us to some of the common challenges. Now, although family engagement has been a focus in our schools uh, through ESSA since 2015 and in South Carolina since the year 2000, uh, the majority of our schools continue to face challenges, uh, challenges such as isolated activities across the district, which often means little to no collaboration across departments. And these activities are also very likely underrepresented by lower economic families and or ethnically diverse families. So the challenges noted here on the slide come from the Family Engagement Toolkit produced from the California Department of Ed, which we will be sharing in more detail with you today. 
the key to these solutions often lies in building educator capacity to partner with families, to think outside the box, and intentionally find ways to include all families. And this is not to say that efforts thus far are unsuccessful, uh, but as was mentioned in the sessions this morning, our efforts can be much more impactful when they are done collaboratively. So when we're thinking about those um, challenges that Cheryl just shared with us, let's look at a couple of quotes. And the first one is also from that toolkit that she just uh, referenced. Some activities may have been in place for many years and may need to be looked at again with a new perspective. And that's followed up by a school level. Next one, Cheryl. It's followed up by a, um, a district level superintendent that says, been thinking a lot about equity, access and the pandemic silver linings. Why on earth wouldn't we continue with virtual parent teacher conferences, IEPs and committee meetings if it increases family engagement and more members of our school community can participate. So when I think about those kind of things, what I'd like you to share in the chat now is what have you been reevaluating as far as your family engagement activities that you've used in the past? What have you just plain eliminated? What have you kept? What have you started that is awesome and you're going to keep using that even when we get back to full-time face-to-face, everybody full-time face-to-face, not just here and there. So what have you thrown out, if anything? What are you keeping? What are you thinking about doing? If you would share that for everybody um, to see, that would be awesome. You can share that in the chat. And I was really happy to see that the superintendent, met, superintendent mentioned the IEP meetings. It's not nearly as intimidating for parents to show up to those um, as it is to sit in a room with, you know, upwards of 10 other adults talking about your child. Keeping the virtual meetings, it increased your participation. Good. Virtual options. Virtual meetings. It's a lot easier to get a lot more done during the day with those virtual meetings because there's no travel time. Virtual options, how valuable they can be. Yep. Yeah, there's always that silver lining. Um, and we're glad that, that you guys are able to oh. utilize the virtual meeting in such a positive way recording the activities and putting them on social media. I appreciate that. That's awesome. You can keep thinking as Cheryl goes on here. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more now about creating engagement pathways. Basically, we are asking you to start assessing your programs. What have you done? What's worked? And where do you go from here? And this part of the session will help to give you a clear direction, something that works for your schools and your communities. You may be familiar with the dual capacity framework. And we want to start this portion with a, a brief clip on this particular framework that was developed by Matt and Kuttner. The toolkit that we're sharing with you today is grounded in the concepts set forth in the dual capacity building framework, and it supports the recommendations found within the South Carolina Family Engagement Framework as well. I'm going to click play and hope all goes well. So far, so good. The first version of the dual capacity building framework for family school partnership was launched at the 2014 Family and Community Engagement Conference held by the Institute for Educational Leadership. This research based framework was authored in collaboration with the United States Department of Education and published by the Southwest Educational Development Lab. The framework was created to offer a tool for educators, policymakers, families, and community members to understand what's needed to cultivate and sustain partnerships between home and school that support student achievement and school improvement. Since 2014, I've gathered information from current research and from stakeholders 
about what was useful and what improvements were needed to the framework. Stakeholders suggested that they wanted the new framework to reflect a sense of growth and improvement and that educators and families come together by building the capacity of each side to work in deeper partnership. Second, the framework needed to more clearly articulate the challenges that got in the way of partnership between families and educators. For example, the new framework points out that many educators have not been exposed to excellent practice, and that's often because they simply haven't received any training in this area. Many families haven't been exposed to excellent practice either, and many have had negative experiences in school, both when they were children and as adults. The way forward starts with the essential conditions, which includes both the process and organizational conditions. These are the nuts and bolts that are a part of any effective family and community engagement practice. The process conditions describe the key components of effective practice to build partnership, and the organizational conditions describe the systems and structures, in other words, the infrastructure needed to support and sustain partnership. And we're going to stop it there. I think what stands out to me here are the ways in which uh, this framework addresses growth, improvement, uh, the production of school home partnerships, and the essential components, the challenges, the challenges faced in family engagement. They, they face it head on and form productive partnerships that are addressed through determining the process and building the infrastructure. And Tina will be sharing more of these details with you. Hold on, Tina. Tina we'll do that as soon slide. as she hits link or hits send on the links that she was just sharing with you. Okay, so the okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the dual capacity framework, uh, you know, and and all of this framework that talks about how do we uh, work with our schools. We've all seen some iteration of this, the plan do reflect adjust. We've all seen some iteration of this, but what does that mean for family engagement? It means that family engagement teams, the team works on building capacity for educators and families using an equitable lens to ensure engagement of all families. ESSA tells us that written district and school family engagement policies, quote, establish the agency's expectations and objectives for meaningful parent and family involvement. Okay, so how do we do that? So we need to make sure that we have the policies describing the way that those expectations are, think, are, are carried out. I'm sorry. So thinking about that, does your district have a family engagement team? I know that I saw a couple of family liaisons listed in the attendees, so I really appreciate that. So I know that district does, but does every district have that? Or is that rolled into some other um, role in the district? Or is there an existing team that could also focus on family engagement? So let's focus on what it can or should do. Cheryl, next slide. So it should review district policies and define its ideal outcomes. What will effective family engagement look like in the district? There should be a written vision and objective to work towards. You need to set goals. It's the only way to know if something is working or not. And it'll be useful in the future steps of this process. So let's look at some potential conversation starters for this group. Do these four questions look familiar to you? I need you to think of DUFOR and the PLC process. Aren't families part of the learning community? So the first one that we see is what do we want educators and families to know and be able to do? I know DUFOR asks the question, what is it that we want all kids to know and be able to do? But we're, we're gonna turn this a little bit. When we're talking about educators and families, what are those skills that they need to be able to effectively engage families for productive conversations about student achievement. The second one, how will we know if they know it? How will we know if they already know the, or they have these skills? So what do we do if they don't know it? And what do we do if they already know it? 
So we just have this iterative process that's just going to walk us through all of these things. We need to know what, um, what, what our outcome is. We need to know what that looks like, what it sounds like, what it feels like. And then how are we going to do that? Next slide. So these next few slides are just going to give you some prompting questions to work toward and define that intended outcome. And these are based, again, on that California toolkit, the family engagement toolkit that Cheryl referenced earlier. And for simplicity's sake, we, we just shortened family engagement because we know in education, we have to have just one more acronym, right? So FE is family engagement. So is family engagement considered a strategy to help achieve the district's mission and vision? Do district plans include family engagement actions as part of each student's learning goals? Okay, we're gonna keep planning here. Next slide. Do you know the answer to all of these questions that are on the screen right now? If you don't, what information is available from partner agencies, from other district programs, community agencies, after school programs, where can you get this information? How do you involve everyone so that you have the best plan possible to increase your family engagement? Next slide. We're still thinking here, guys. This is gonna be a hard, honest look at the way we do business. No growth happens by staying in our comfort zone. Do you know the answer to this? Do some educators feel more comfortable talking to some groups of families than to others? Are there different levels, grade levels of educators who feel more confident talking to families? And when I think about these questions, I think about the proverbial parent-teacher conferences. And the uh, uh, last couple of years, we actually did some mock parent-teacher conferences for our new teachers. So they knew what to expect. Some of us had fun with it and really played that truly annoying parent that comes in and just questions every single thing that comes out of your mouth. I, I literally had a teacher look at me and say, wait, can we start over? Honey, you don't get a do do over in a parent-teacher conference. That's not an option. That's why we're practicing this. So are your teachers, especially those newbies, are they prepared to talk to all families? Okay, next question. And we've got another slide even thinking about it here. Do you know the answers to this? Do you know if some families feel more welcome at school than others? How are you going to get that information? How are you gonna get those families to let you know what's going on? Are you sure you know what they're thinking or are you just making assumptions? And then I need you to channel your inner two-year-old for that last one. Why? 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 Just keep asking why until you find the answer to that. Why are some people more comfortable than others? Okay, we had a lot of prompting, a lot of hard questions, and you might be thinking, oh, that's a lot of time pl spent planning. And for some of us, that'd be me, impatience might be creeping in. But when you spend the time front-loading something, you usually get better results as the outcome. So now it's time to do. You want to do the next slide? It's time to do, okay? You've, you've spent a thorough amount of time planning. So your do stage should be able to write and run itself. But you also need to plan for how long you're going to do something before you start the next stage. So are you gonna try this for one week, one month, one year? How long are you going to draw this out before you start looking at the next um, stage, Cheryl? Which is to reflect. It's time to look at what we've done. Is it working? Did we do what we said we were going to do? What popped up that we didn't anticipate even after we spent all that time planning? So we're looking at this and thinking, all right, what, what do I do now? So the next couple of slides are gonna help or give, give examples of how to look at those actions objectively to quantify those, if you will. Okay, so again, these are just straight from the Cal Family Engagement Toolkit from California. And the first one is, it says, um, did we do what we planned? We said we were gonna do three parent forums. Well, we did two. So the notes piece out here, that's critical. Why did you only do two? I really like the fact that they had 
the number of people that attended. Why, and, and they reference it, they're channeling their inner two-year-old as well. Add a note, why? Why was outreach not effective at some sites? The second one, professional development. There you go. So we did it and it was good, okay? The next slide is an example of, um, did it accomplish what we wanted? Okay, so I look at that. The first one, rocked it. Second one, hmm, kind of, sort of, yeah. Third one, rocked it. The fourth one, I would have been the person sitting around the table going, I don't know how we mark this as somewhat. I look at this and it's, you know, there's, and I'm, I'm coming at this from my special ed lens, remember. Family members notify the school when their child is absent, okay? Attendance clerks report an increase in the number of calls from families when a child is absent. My special ed lens says, wait, wait, where did we start from? What's my baseline data? And where did I wanna go? That's how I'm gonna know if I made progress. So just because the attendance clerk said that, and I'm not doubting them at all, I wanna put it here, guys. What can I see? What can I hold? What do I know happened? Okay. Thank you, Tina. Those are some great points. I hope you guys are thinking along with her. Uh, the planning stage, reflecting stage, they're all very important to what our aim is ultimately. Once you do the, the planning, the do, the reflect, then we're going to adjust. And those of you who are familiar with IEPs know that adjusting or being able to adjust is a major component of this process. If children aren't making progress, we look at why and then we adjust. And it's the same principle within the PDRA. Uh, also, it goes back to the questions that Tina was asking earlier, the do four questions, three and four. What do we do if they do make progress? And what do we do if they don't? And much like an IEP development process, an IEP, an individualized education program, uh, the answers to those questions are based on the data. They are based on the information that you collected, the collaboration time with the families and the school staff, reflections on what's been done. And like the IEP process, the plan, do, reflect, and adjust process is repeated as often as needed to promote growth improvement and effective school family partnerships. And what we want to do in that is to reach all families. So in my opinion, an essential part of making adjustments and improving programs is determining, determining that you will engage all families. In special education circles, we like to use the phrase, all means all. So oftentimes though, students with disabilities and their families, they're placed in a separate entity and they're not part of the family involvement plans. And I know at times people are thinking, well, you know, that's special ed, you know, they'll handle it. But the truth is special education students are gen ed students first, and their families should be included in every conversation of family engagement and considerations made so that they are able to participate as well. And the same holds for ethnically diverse families. Being part of a different culture should not keep us from finding ways to include these families in our efforts. And while I'm talking about this, I know oftentimes we need a resource, we need some, some help in doing just that and reaching our ethnically diverse families, our linguistically different families. And one of the resources we have in this state is our South Carolina Parent Training and Information Center, which is Family Connection South Carolina. Some of you may have heard of Family Connection. Uh, and they can be a great resource for you. They offer services to support families of students served within special education and families of children with chronic ailments. They also have a Spanish bilingual, bilingual staff members and um, their website is the place on our resource slide as well. And we do appreciate the work that Family Connection does in our state. So we're making connections, right? Uh, the National Center on Safe Supporting Learning Environments holds that family school community partnerships are a shared responsibility, a reciprocal process, whereby schools and families take initiatives 
to actively support the children's development and learning. And schools can make efforts to listen to parents, to support them, and to ensure that they have the tools to be active participants in their children's school experiences. So when we're making connections with families of different cultures and languages, that has to be intentional. We have to do that intentionally. We have to create ways to share information as well as ways that families can share information with the school. And we already talked about some of the things you can do uh, virtually, the parent teacher conference, the IEP meeting. Uh, some schools are actually holding virtual social and emotional learning sessions for their parents and their students, and which is a great way to build trust in the, in the community. Uh, Dr. Pulowski mentioned a lot of ways today to, to have that intentional two-way communication, which is essential and is definitely needed when we're, we're working with parents um, who are unfamiliar with the American school culture um, and, and can use some extra supports in being able to connect. And our parent liaisons, uh, I know this is something that you guys work with, making connections between the school and families. And I would encourage our administrators and teachers on the line to reach out to you, I'm not trying to add more work, <laughs> but you are a great resource as well uh, in connecting with, with families because our aim is to provide connections to student learning. That's, that's strong, right? And this means family engagement activities that are aligned with the district goals for student outcomes, which is one of the questions we asked earlier about family engagement, is it in district policy? families and educators engaged in this two-way communication about what students are learning at school and family engagement activities help families to provide support at home for learning. Now, Tina and I have shared a lot with you today, uh, but we want to also share some resources that are available to you. The first two resources you see here, a cadre working together series and collaborating with families and students with disabilities, both of those work mainly are mainly for working with families whose children do have a disability. Um, there's even an IRIS module that you can follow. Uh, we have the dual capacity webpage, engaging families virtually, your family connection, South Carolina is a resource. And at the bottom, there's the OSIS virtual hybrid learning. That's found on our SEDE webpage and it lists uh, things you can do with families, in particular in the virtual and or hybrid uh, learning. And it's good for families with disabilities, but it's good, it works for any, any family uh, at any family in the state. So we wanted to share those with you. And we also have some virtual learning specific articles that we think would be very uh, beneficial as well, especially those who are working either in that hybrid or that full virtual setting. And we are now taking questions. Do we have any questions? If you have any questions, you can put those in the chat box and we can um, have Tina and Cheryl answer those for you. And since we do have some extra time, was there anything you guys wanted us to reiterate? I think this is one thing that we all got good at over the last 18 months is this wait time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that used to bother me. Yeah, that bother me. <laughs> Is there anyone with us who uh, works with families with uh, who have students with a disability or is the parent of someone with a disability? So I'm reading Kathleen's question and she says, what part of the process is usually most challenging for programs? 
I personally, and Cheryl may have a different answer. I would say the planning. It's that making sure that you have it set up the best possible way you can. There's always going to be hurdles. There's going to be road bumps along the way. We know that. But getting it set up and anticipating as many of those hurdles as you can, it, it's always helpful to have that one person on your group, the one that you kind of want to throttle sometimes because they always throw up the yeah, but. But that's who you need on your team as you're trying to make this plan. Okay. So for me, it's the planning process. Cheryl, would you say it's something different? No, I would agree with you that it is the planning process. And what's essential, I believe, is the team that you bring together. This is not a one man or one woman uh, work. You do need team. You need the different voices to speak to the work. Um, knowing what data to dig up, I would pull in my district policies, my school policies. I would connect with my parent liaisons. I would see what's going on district-wide, and then we can hone it down to the school level. Um, and so the planning piece is, is important, but the team that you pull together is, is essential because they will need to follow you throughout this work from beginning to end. And as you go through the process, you may see that you need some other voices as well. Um, so yes, I would say the, the planning. The next question we have is uh, looking for some ideas to motivate parents to engage in the parenting workshops. Cheryl, do you want to start with that one? Would you like me to go? Well, I'll say briefly that, um, and thank you from a special education lens, as well as an ethnically diverse lens. Oftentimes, uh, families with disabilities and uh, families who are from a different culture, they don't feel uh, welcomed or they don't feel like they can be a part of what's going on. So if you do some intentional outreach specifically to families with disabilities or, or students with disabilities, specifically to your ethnically or culturally diverse families, uh, that would make a difference as well as those, out, those general outreaches. But if you do something specific, that would motivate them to say, you know, they do see me, they, they are interested in what I have to say. They are interested in my child. And I would follow up with that with making sure that the topics that you have for the parenting workshops are 100% relevant to the audience that you're trying to reach. If you have those families with students with disabilities, as Cheryl mentioned, or the ethnically diverse families, and you do have some who are participating, figure out why they're there and what might be some barriers Okay, so reach out to those families and figure out what's going on. Make sure, and again, just make sure that what you're presenting is what they need. And, and it might even be a, a call. None of us like to cold call parents because as soon as you do, they don't answer the phone as soon as they see it's the school calling nine times out of 10. I got around that by having the kids call because I was in high school. Okay, so have the kids call because they're going to answer their kids' phone. And then just talk to them. Hey, you know what, Mrs. Smith, I see that you were not, you have not attended any of these. What could we do differently? What would make you want to come here? And, and just reach out to the families. And I know that that takes time and time is not always a resource that we have, but it's, it's that intentional outreach as Cheryl said. And I think, I think it was Dr. Pulowski who mentioned something today about um, in your activities, in your family engagement activities, include something that the children are involved in. Mm -hmm. That will pull in your parents. And um, that could be something that could start a, a more positive relationship because trust has to be built between school and families in order for family engagement to, to work and to have that two-way communication. Okay. Um, Yolanda, you are going to have access to all of the web links as soon as we uh, are at, through our uh, PowerPoint. They're all going to be there, but I will go back up and I will try to grab those again and put those in here for you. Because I only put a couple in and the first one was the um, title one question and answer that Cheryl referenced. And the second one was for dual capacity. So I'll grab those and put them in here again. And uh, we also have some references in this uh, PowerPoint, which you will get uh, later on. 
with some other, there's a toolkit here that we've been referencing uh, throughout this presentation. There are some good articles here. Um, you could hear information from the National Parent Teachers Association and of course our state family engagement framework. We also want to give you our contact information. Please don't hesitate to email us to call. Um, more than welcome to answer any questions that you may have. The, you can't say the door is open but because <laughs> <laughs> call <laughs> or email. Either way, we're here. Yeah. We, we want to hear from you. We definitely do. Yep. And uh, Tina and I, thank you. Both of us are Minion fans, so as yeah. I saw this, like, oh, this is too cute. Um, but Tina and I, thank you so much for, for being here with us today. Yeah, and good luck with those those family engagements. That those conversations are not always easy, but they are necessary. And thanks to you both for presenting today. Um, we hope everyone has gotten a lot of good information, and that they'll contact you if they have questions. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We gave you an additional four minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Time to run to the rest.